you know, Ann Vanesky, you know, describe what you do teach and what okay. levels that you teach at. All right, I have middle school math and language arts. So I have seventh and eighth grade math and seventh and eighth grade language arts. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when you look at the role of, or the, your role as a teacher in a customized environment, what are the things that you find hardest to get to? What, what, what gives you a struggle when you try to customize? I think the hardest part is just um, being ready for anything. I know that on any given day that my students could be at any place in their learning and I have to be prepared for that. So it takes a lot of planning up front. Um, I put together a lot of resources in my spare time <laughs> and in the summer, um, things that I anticipate that my students might need. Um, but I think that's probably the biggest challenge is just you have to be a content expert. You have to be able to answer any question on any given day. And you have to have resources available or at least be able to point them in the direction of the resources when it's time. So, Are there certain things like within the school where it's a barrier to you? Uh, I could really customize if I could only get past this. Are there things yeah, that are your way? <laughs> I think we're getting better about it, um, but I think our, the schedule is still a pretty strong barrier for me personally, um, only because I have middle school, so they don't have quite the same amount of uh, flexibility as the high school does yet, um, mostly just due to staffing. I'm the only middle school teacher who's not an administrator. So for me, that's probably the biggest challenge is that I have the middle school kids as a big group most of the day. For me, if I could get rid of the class periods and have somewhere else for my kids to work independently while I'm working with a small group, that would be ideal. Um, for now, what we do is I just try to do that within my classroom. I work with a small group while my others are working either collaboratively or independently without me. Mm -hmm. um, but it is more challenging just because I have a full classroom then full of kids. So for me, the schedule is probably the biggest thing. Um, I did get to switch classrooms this year, so I have a much more flexible learning space. Um, I'm dealing with tables instead of desks, and so it makes the room a lot friendlier. The tables are easily moved. My kids can group and regroup organically. Um, it's a lot nicer than sitting in rows and desks and so everything schedule else. schedule and space is... Schedule and space is probably the biggest challenge as far as barriers currently. I mean, I think we're pretty open to working with all kinds of things. But I would like to have more time just to work individually or one-on-one -on -one with kids instead of being tied to that 55-minute schedule. Mm -hmm. what, what have you done with the schedule here? How have you changed things up? Well, we have a customized learning Thursday. That's kind of how we started when we first dipped our toe into the pool here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, on Thursdays, we run a skinny schedule. So we run our whole day in the morning, and then our students have customized learning time in the afternoon. And from 1 to 3.30, they choose where they're going to work or who they're going to work with. So if they have work that they need to do for a particular teacher, they can work with them. If they have a group that they need to work with, they can work with that group. If they want a quiet space, we have those places available. Mm -hmm. And for my kids, my advisory kids, they generally use my room as a study table. They come in and they're working on all kinds of things. Um, none of them are my actual students from my class. I'm working with high school students at that time that are working on chemistry or Spanish or history or reading, whatever. I mean, I'm kind of learning to be a jack of all trades too <laughs> when it comes to that thing and just be a facilitator. Help point them in the direction of resources more than anything else. Mm -hmm. So with <clears throat> that environment then, do you have some... Are you still pretty uh, grade level oriented, or is it? We, um, are you able yeah. to mix kids grade levels that aren't necessarily by grade? We're still pretty much grade level this year, but next year's schedule is changing, and we are definitely starting to mix more of the grades. I know in math we're going to instead of going from seventh grade math to eighth grade math to algebra, we will have a seventh grade math, and then it's going to be at least tentatively, a math 8 through 10. And so we might have kids working on 8th grade math, we might have kids on algebra, we might have kids already started on algebra too. Within my classroom, I have students, because we meet them wherever they are, so I have some kids that are below grade level working, and I have some kids that are working on algebra already in my classroom. They have that flexibility. So 
I, I think we're going to see more and more of that. I think we'll see more team teaching on our calendar for next year and um, just a lot more flexibility with the time. So if, if your role is changing where you're less delivery of mm -hmm. the actual information, so how, how do you deliver information? How do the kids get that direct instruction? Well, the direct instruction is still happening, but it's not happening to the whole group at once. The direct instruction is happening in very small groups or individually. So, and we ask the students when they come across a new concept or new topic that they get some of the background information a little bit first. So we give them resources, videos, uh, handouts, other peers that they know are working on the same thing. And we want them to become acquainted with it before we actually have direct instruction time. Um, <clears throat> from there, I let them start whatever concept it is they're working on. And when I see that they come to a place that they need help, I either pull together a small group or I work individually with that student. So they're still getting direct instruction. It's just not in front of the whole classroom. Okay. So, How do you handle the flexible grouping? I mean, it's got to be a little bit maddening to deal with <laughs> students are together on this, but now all of a sudden they're not. Right. And how do you manage having, yeah. making sure you get kids in, with the right kids? Right. <clears throat> um, that is challenging. You have to really, you have to know where your kids are. And I do think with the customization, you have a much better idea than the traditional way. Before, you know, they would all do an assignment and they'd turn it in and some would get a 70 and some would get a 95. And you really couldn't tell what they knew or didn't know based on the daily work you're getting. Um, with the customization, there's a ton of pre-assessment. So I have a good idea going in who already is comfortable with the material, who really needs some prerequisite skills. And I work to try to get those kids together. Um, but it is challenging. I mean, it's you have to really be on top of things and... You have to be ready to switch groups when it's needed. Um, you might find out through formative assessment that they're ready to move to a different group or they're ready to work with somebody else. So it's just a lot of flexibility, a lot of patience, and understanding that it does get a little messy and you have to be comfortable with that. <laughs> so. Tell me more about your assessment. How has that evolved or changed over time? <laughs> well, for me, it's changed a huge amount uh, before. I mean, I hate to admit, but I was one of those teachers who taught everything I needed to teach and assessed at the end to see what they learned. And I don't think that I was in the minority then, um, but I just really realized once we switched to this model, the importance of pre-assessment. And, you know, I think in some cases we don't give our students enough credit for what they already know. And on the other side, I think sometimes we make assumptions about what they do know. And so the pre-assessment is the key for me for moving, it's just the key to starting. You have to know where your students are before you can even begin. Um, so for me, <laughs> pre-assessment's the biggest first step. And then I have an idea of where to go with them. And then I do a lot of formative assessment along the way um, that's not graded necessarily. It's through conversation, it's through um, daily work, it's through observation, and it's a lot less worksheets. I mean, I don't, I don't think I even give worksheets or anything like that anymore. I mean, my, I just think it's a lot more organic, but I have a much better idea, a much clearer idea of where each of my students are than I ever did before. So much of traditional revolves around percentages, but what, yeah. what has it evolved to for you if it's not percentages of worksheets? Well, it's really about mastering the standards. I mean, we are also making the switch to standards-based grading, so the standards are in my mind all the time. I'm thinking all the time about my reporting standards and I'm watching for evidence that my students are meeting certain criteria. Are they meeting that proficiency? Are they getting to a level three on our proficiency rubric? And if they're not, what kind of support do I need to give them to get them there? So I, I just think it's a lot less, um, a lot less of a judgment on the back end of what your student produces. And the assessment is happening a lot more formatively for a different reason. Your formative assessment now, I think, is really geared toward building your student achievement and guiding your instruction, where before it was more of a judgment on what they did or didn't learn. Mm -hmm. so. Do you find some students embrace customized learning more than others? Are there some that struggle with customized learning? What, yeah. How do you see that with the spectrum of students? You know, I think, obviously, yes, we do have students who struggle with it. Um, I think the hardest part for students who've never done it before is time management. 
and just understanding, get, having some intrinsic motivation. If, if they've never been exposed to it and they, uh, if it's just completely foreign to them, it's hard for them to understand that we're probably not going to be on your case all the time about this deadline, <laughs> but you still need to get it done. And I think that that is hard for some of our students. The other thing I would say that's been a challenge is that we have students who, in the old method, um, I hate to use the term played the game, but they did kind of play the game. They learned what they needed to, and they were compliant in class, and they got their daily points. And then when they went to take their summative assessment, they might not have passed it, but it balanced out with their daily work. And so they still move forward. And what we did when we went to this model was we said that all of our students had to pass every assessment. And so that's been a challenge for those students who kind of played the game before <laughs> because we have raised the bar and the expectations. So I, I think for those students, it's probably the most challenging. I think for my students who are high flyers or my students who really struggle, it has been so beneficial. Um, you know, and I, I would say a lot of our students in the middle too. It's been beneficial for almost every student but some don't necessarily see the benefit like we see it, so. Well, and I think some people perceive that the customized learning is only best for the top kids. Right, <laughs> and I would say that's not accurate, <laughs> just because I've seen so much with my kids who struggle. And for the first time, I have students in my classroom who feel successful in, for instance, math. They come in two grade levels behind maybe, and they've had seven years of feeling inferior because they can't keep up with their classmates. They can't grasp the material fast enough. And they just never feel like they learn at all. And the gap just gets bigger and bigger for those kids. And for me, taking a step back and saying, okay, well, let's go back to where you were. Let's take a look at what's missing and fill in those gaps. It creates such a sense of relief for those students. Like, oh my gosh, somebody is actually gonna just take the time for me and understand. And yes, I know they're still behind but they've gained something that's immeasurable. I mean, they've gained confidence and they understand that I'm not going to rush past them. They count, they matter in my classroom. And I just think that that's so worth it. I, I, the high flyers obviously benefit, but the struggling learners benefit just as much, if not more, I would say. From your standpoint, how do you communicate to teacher pace? I mean, you hear the reference of teacher pace, how to make sure students don't get too far behind. Right. How do you determine that, communicate that with kids? Well, that, that again is a challenge for us, um, mostly because we just are trying to find the right management system for it. Mm -hmm. um, currently, we use Infinite Campus, and we set our pace in the grade book. And so we have due dates of what it would be to be on pace but you quickly kind of fall off the edge of the cliff <laughs> and realize that this is really going to be a struggle because I have kids that are working at their pace and doing fine, but they're about two months behind where we should be. So I, I think that is a big challenge. I mean, honestly, just being really proactive with parents about what their students doing and where we have to go is helpful. Um, I think next year I'll probably put it on a calendar that I can share with my students it's, I think that might be easier for them. It, that is a struggle, just to set a very clear pacing guide. We use Blackboard Learn. We put out a week at a glance, basically, of this is what we're doing this week, this is where you should be. But it doesn't fit every student. So, Is there another end of pace? I, I think sometimes I hear teachers concerned that some students will just zoom through everything. <coughs> and is there a different end of the, the pace where it's, you shouldn't get through this this fast. You need to go um, deeper or... I haven't experienced that myself. Okay. I have, um, I have two eighth grade students, but they are my strongest math students probably. That In the past, we would have sent them right away to algebra. They would have not done eighth grade math. And we decided this year that we weren't going to do that. We were going to have all the eighth graders do the eighth grade curriculum, and those that were ready could move on to algebra when it was time. And so I have two right now that are doing algebra. I have about four more that are coming on in the next couple weeks, probably. Um, but I haven't... Maybe they're individually yes, at that point? Yes, that they're, but they're still sitting in my eighth grade math classroom, but they're about a third of the way done with Algebra 1 because <laughs> they just work at... That's the pace that they're at. So I haven't had a problem with kids just zooming through. I don't really see that we've had that issue here. I'm trying to think. If, if they have, you know, 
they would have had to have proven that they had mastered the material. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that's an issue. It's not about checking boxes. I mean, the kids really have to show what they know. Mm -hmm. So if they know it that quickly, then great. But I haven't had anybody zoom through and made me uncomfortable with it. Mm -hmm. So. You hear often the terms voice and choice. We need to give students more mm -hmm. voice and choice. In what ways have you found that you can give students more voice and choice in what they do? Well, for my students, they can be assessed any way that they really want to. I mean, obviously, for language arts and things like that, I do have to look at their writing and things like that. But <clears throat> when possible, if, if they're really struggling with something, we'll just sit and have a conversation. I, I have a pretty good idea what they know or don't know based on what they tell me. I know most of our teachers give them lots of options for assessment, um, whether it's a concept map or a written test or um, putting together some sort of presentation or having an interview, things like that. I think we've, I think we've been really good with our students as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. um, I know that we're having a lot of conversations with our students. We have advisory groups and we're having lots and lots of conversations with the students about what their thoughts are, what things they'd like to see, what things they would like to see changed. <laughs> So we're getting lots of input from them. When you look at student interest, how do you find ways to allow their interest to become part of their work? Well, I think the most important thing with any teaching is just developing a relationship first with the students. I mean, if without that, this it, it won't work because the students will just feel like you're push, push, push. Um, but I think just getting to know your kids I mean, for me, it's just talking to my kids, just getting to know them. We've done student interest surveys and things like that. Um, but it's just really getting to know them and being aware and paying attention to what they discuss and what they're interested in and then doing what you can to tie it in. And oftentimes it might mean turning it back to the student and saying, this is what you need to prove that you know. How could we do that? And letting the student come up with an idea instead of me trying to figure out 35 different ways. <laughs> Is there a particular piece of content right now that you're kind of in the process of transferring from a traditional or that you're converting to customized? What you know, kind of struggles? And I think probably just for me, the language arts is probably more traditional still than math, um, mostly because traditionally we've already had guided reading and things like that where kids were working at their own level. but. The part that is a little more challenging is the writing and the grammar and things like that because they have to be able to communicate. It's so important that mm -hmm. they can. And I really am trying to bring everybody up to speed instead of customizing as much as I might <laughs> with that. So they, they get to write about whatever they'd like, but it, we still have to meet the grade level standards for language arts. So okay. that one's a challenge.